There we go. Awesome. All right, thank you so much for having us here today. I am Jeanette Clark. I am the director. I'm going to be brief because Lindsay has put so much time doing some of the research that ties right along with a lot of things that are happening over at the museum. But I do want to mention quickly, we're open. We opened April 1st. I'm not sure how that happened with Mother Nature this year, but we did it. <laughs> we are um, open seven days a week. Um, underground tours also running seven days a week, although there's a lot of um, underground tours that are booked starting at the end of May, beginning of June because the school kids come and trounce on our grounds and hopefully learn a whole lot about youth. So we have 25, 30 schools coming to visit us um, here at the end of the school year. It's always exciting to have them, and we're always happy to see them going to the meeting. <laughs> um, so anyway, we are available for um, field trips of all ages. Um, we start, we have preschool groups that come visit us, on up to college groups, and of course, um, adult groups as well. We have several of them planned throughout of the season. The season runs through October 31st. Um, although last year Mother Nature was nice to us again and we actually kept our doors open on Fridays and Saturdays through December 8th. So we'll do that again. So if you have family in town near the holidays and such, give us a call, see if we're open. Unless there's like three feet of snow, we're closed. Um, so anyway, come visit us. Um, few of the, I do have a list of the events going on. This season we have a few exciting events. Our um, annual meeting of membership is actually May 29th. So if you're a member or interested in being a member, please come see us. We did redo the membership levels a little bit this year to um, um, add some more availability and more options there. I have a list as well as Julie in the back is part of our new DOSA program and she has some membership forms as, as well. And speaking of DOSA program, we're very excited to have a new program this year that we're still looking for volunteers for, which is our docent program. Our docent program is an opportunity really to come hang out at the museum and talk to the guests, tell them where the bathrooms are because they can never find them, um, share some view history, share your knowledge of an area, and if you don't know much, we'll teach you. Um, it's always fun to hang out and talk to the guests. That's one of my favorite parts of the job is when I actually get the opportunity to go out on the grounds. Inevitably, you run into the, a guest and you get to talk a little bit about the <coughs> history, find out where they're from, and they add their stories in. So that's a new program at museums um, this year, as well as our group of volunteers Hopefully Lindsay remembers this as well, but it is National Preservation Week. I did it, I remembered. I knew I was going to um, And a lot of our preservation happens because of our volunteers. There's a few of which are here. So I want to express my personal thank you to all of our volunteers to helping us at the museum fulfill our mission of preserving and sharing beauty mining history. Um, I have some information on the museum. As I said, I don't want to go too long. I'll take questions later. The biggest thing is we're open. But I am proud to introduce to you Lindsay Mulcahy. She's been working, she has some artifacts here, another project that she's been working on that ties into these artifacts. And she's done all the research, PowerPoint, she's got her cards, she knows the information, she knows her stuff. So ladies and gentlemen, Lindsay Mulcahy, enjoy. so she likes to bring home germs. <laughs> of course, it cycles through the family, and I'm the last one to have it. That's the longest with me. So, um, I'm Lizzie Mulcahy, and I'm excited to be the curator up at the World Museum of Mining. I actually started this position last fall. Um, Jeanette had heard of me, and we were doing some business up there, and we got to talking, and she said, I need a curator. And my husband said, hire Lindsay, please. Um, so <laughs> um, I finally have a career in Butte history, which is what I love. And I know quite a few of you from um, attending uh, the Butte history adult education course with Chris Fisk and Jim McCarthy, um, and uh, other things too. That's how I know quite a few of you, along with our Butte historical memorials group. 
Um, but anyway, uh, a lot of people, when I tell them I'm the curator at the World Museum of Mining, they say, oh, that's great. What's a curator? Uh, <laughs> so I looked up a couple definitions, and the short definition is a custodian or keeper of a museum or other collection. So that's a short and sweet of it, and that's usually what I tell people. Um, a longer definition is a keeper of a cultural heritage institution who is charged with an institution's collections and involved with the interpretation of heritage material. And that's kind of the one I like better. Basically, I'm the one that gets to take all these items in when they come to the museum, and I get to put them into our system, and I get to learn about them. And my goal, um, since taking in these new um, acquisitions, is to basically find their story. We don't. We don't need just another top hat. We want to know, who did this top hat belong to? Why is this important uh, in our museum? What is the relevance to Butte history? We don't want to just keep taking in things uh, that don't have relevance. So that's kind of what I've been doing. Um, and as Jeanette said, it is National Preservation Week. And I'm not the only one that does that at the museum. Thankfully, we have a lot of great volunteers. As she mentioned, we have quite a few of them here um, supporting us. And they are also uh, uh, basically curators for us. So. Um, how would I have to use that computer to change it? <laughs> oh, the little. No, it's okay. Let's see, I hit the wrong way. So, um, one of our missions at the museum, and the uh, tagline that you'll see is, where history tells a story, and uh, that's kind of what we're trying to do here with these items. And another thing that we're working on is a pamphlet. So when you come to the museum, you come to the museum and, uh, sorry, you get there and you walk around Helmer and Gulch, but you don't often have a great understanding of all the buildings there, sorry. Oh, cool. look at that. <laughs> Man, technology, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but, so we've been working on a pamphlet, um, and we're going to, uh, we're working with somebody to create a sandboard map so you can walk around. And has anybody been to Bannock and had their map? And that, that's pretty much what we're working towards. So it'll have um, a description as to what this building was used for. Maybe there's a neat artifact inside that we want to highlight, and that's what we've been working toward. <laughs> So we're trying to make it so where history tells a story and you get the complete story here. So one of the things that I uh, have been wondering for years at the museum is where did the Durant Railway Station come from? Um, and everybody says, well, it might have come from the actual Durant Railway Station, but we're not entirely sure. And the paperwork actually wasn't at the museum to show this. Uh, through so many years, 54 years? of being open. I can't do math, obviously. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, things get lost. There's been so many people coming and going in that time frame that things got lost in the shuffle. Um, so I came up here, actually, one day to do some research for our pamphlet, and I set out on the Durant, and lo and behold, they have the proper paperwork that tells me where the Durant came from. And uh, a little bit of history on the Durant. Um, uh, so our Durant Railway Station came, as I mentioned, Durant Canyon, which is near Fairmont, if you're not familiar with it. Originally, the Northern Pacific laid track there in 1883, and then the Butte and the Con Pacific Railway did, and then finally the Milwaukee did. And uh, the depot, the would basically right here, uh, there was also a little hotel there that the Kessler family ran, and they... Uh, would basically be a line, or a place you could switch lines. So if you're on the BAMP and you wanted to hop on the Milwaukee, that'd be a stopping point where you could get off one train and get into another. <coughs> I'm just going to drop these and leave them. How about that? <laughs> um, another interesting thing I found out, it was named for Billy Durant. There was a man named M.S. Dean, um, and he named it the Durant for his friend Billy Durant, who was uh, the founder of General Motors. So I thought that was pretty interesting too. Yeah, kind of a random little tidbit there. Um, but a lot of people weren't sure where the Durant came from, I think, because it doesn't match this building here. And so most likely the idea is there was more buildings than this one, and we just can't see them in the photos that we have. Uh, so the building that we have is called the Operators Building, and it was donated to the museum and moved there in 1976. And this area out here, if you head out to Durant Canyon, is actually on the National Historic Landmark Register. And the foundation for the building that's at the museum, which looks like so, if you're not familiar, um, the foundation is still out there. So I've been waiting for the snow to melt. I could probably actually go out there now, um, but it's on my list of things to go do and find. Um, for some of you, you know that I like to dra drag my kids all over the countryside <laughs> and find random pieces of view history. And this is definitely one that we're going to go find. So, so uh, Lindsay, my the, kids are the road is still closed. 
It's still closed? Tr I tried to go up there through German Gulch the other day and couldn't go through. Okay, well, that's good. That was Sunday. That Probably was Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> every day we're getting less and less snow here, so. Yeah. <coughs> so sorry about my call. Um, another thing I kept running across in my research for this pamphlet was something called the beaver block, which I had heard of, but I'm too young to remember it. So I'm like, well, what's the beaver block? What's the significance? And I'll tell you the significance of it in the museum here in a minute. First, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. Um, it was built by 18, in, in 1890 by Henry Valaton and um, Marcia So. I don't know. Does anybody know how to say it? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, nobody knows what I'm talking about, so therefore I said it correctly. How about that? Uh, <laughs> Um, and Henry Belton, I was able to find more information on him. He came to Butte in 1880. He was a mayor twice here, actually. He owned a top-of-the-line livery stable where they actually, instead of dirt floors, they had granite floors. So this was high class for those horses. Yeah. Um, so he partnered with this other guy, and they built the beaver block, which, as you can see, was three stories tall. And I'm assuming most of you actually remember this if you grew up here in the Butte area. Um, and uh, originally what was in there was the first, <laughs> excuse me, was the Silverbow National Bank. There was a grocery store and a shoe store on that first floor, and then they had offices in the top two floors. Um, uh, the kind of iconic figure of the beaver block is right up here. You can see the little beaver. He was actually quite large, um, but that's why it was named the beaver block, was that little figure there. Um, and it was actually made of copper, but it was painted gray, which a lot of people didn't quite realize that. The last occupant of the Beaver Block was the Beaver Bar, and that closed in 1960 after the strike of 1959-1960, which had a great toll on the city here. Um, so then it was vacant for eight years, and the First National Bank of Butte decided they were going to build a drive-in, a uh, drive-through bank, uh, which is now Wells Fargo, and I can see it right there. <laughs> so um, that's why it was torn down. So it was slated for demolition, and the Beaver, was actually supposed to head on over to the World Museum of Mining. And um, the Montana Historical Society actually was allowed permission to go inside of it and take some of the historical pieces of it uh, that were part of that structure. And thankfully they did. Um, it was getting ready to be torn down by a man, man named Claire Volet. And <laughs> did you hear that? <laughs> um, and actually my good friend told me this story. Um, and it was getting getting ready to be taken down, uh, Claire Volet, and um, who remembers Claire Volet? Oh, only a couple, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got a couple that are like, oh yeah. So, <laughs> um, anyway, right before it was to be torn down, this place magically caught on fire, as things happened to do during that time frame here, right? Oh yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, Right before that occurred, they moved this beaver and they put it on top of the building for safekeeping. Oh. And guess what? That beaver disappeared in that fire. Oh. Um, so that That's beaver did not make it to the mining museum, unfortunately. But the, the great intent was there. But as I mentioned, the Montana Historical Society did go in and take a lot of items out of there. Um, and here it is being torn down after that fire. Wow. <laughs> um, and thankfully they did go in there because they actually ended up donating some of it to the World Museum of Mining. And one of those things that came out of here, and this is where I kept popping up when I was doing my research, the beaver block, um, this wainscoting that you see in our optometrist parlor is from the beaver block that two men came, took out of. Their names were John Coleman and Bob Morgan. And if you also glance into our tobacco shop, and the saloon, you'll see this beautiful tin ceiling, and that also came out of the beaver block. So we got little bits of butte history that you didn't even know were there. Yeah. So that's kind of neat. So we're hoping to convey that with our new pamphlet that's coming out here. Um, yeah. So does anybody follow us on Instagram or Facebook? Yeah. So this is your answer. Uh, on Wednesdays, we do every now and then, what in the world Museum of Mining Wednesday? <laughs> I posted this photo today, and I said, what in the world museum of mining is this? Come to our brown bag to find out. So now you have your answer. <laughs> yeah. You get a prize? 
Um, yeah. Uh, they get to, you know, come hang out with us and volunteer to be a docent. So they can find out more. <laughs> yeah, and you come on Wednesdays when you're a volunteer, you get donuts. And not just any donuts, Town Talk. Oh wow. Yeah, so now you guys are like, oh, we're switching. We're coming over here now. So, so um, I'm going to tell you about a few of our articles that we got in our collection since I've been curator here, and the ones that I've been really excited about. Um, the first one is uh, this hat here. Um, it belonged to a man named Henry Hopkins, and he was born in Butte, actually, in 1881. His father was Robert, he was a miner. His mother was Olivia, she was a housewife. Um, and they originally, when they came to Montana, they lived in Bannock, and then in 1879, they moved to Butte. Um, and then shortly thereafter, Henry was born. Um, he would move on to uh, marry Alberta Spears on November 8th, 1911, which I didn't put his birthday up there, but Henry was born on November 7th, so the day after, he got uh, the day after his birthday, he got married which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, they lived at 1200 West Platinum um, at one point, and then they lived at 415 West Granite. Both homes are still standing, beautiful. Um, and uh, they would have two children, a son named Henry, who went by Stuart. He was born in 1914. His daughter, Mary Isabella, she went by Isabella, was born in 1920, and she would go on, and her last name would be Gilly. Uh, interestingly enough, um, Henry Hopkins, registered from World War I draft. And it was interesting to find this piece of paperwork because they were asked to describe themselves on this World War I draft certificate. And they had some options. And one was, what height are you? Are you tall height? Uh, like medium? I can't remember what the word they used in short. So a uh, little description of Henry for you because I can't find any photographs of him. Was he was of tall height, slender build, brown hair, and brown eyes. So he sounded like he was tall, dark, and handsome, right, ladies? <laughs> so, um, he would go on to the University of Virginia, where he graduated from law school in 1906. And of course, he came back to Great Butte, Montana. And he uh, would practice law here for 54 years. And he did so in the Herbert Towers, where he had his offices. Um, he was a lawyer for the railroads. I can't find exactly which railroad or what he did, um, but we know that much. Um, him and his wife would eventually move to Glendale, Arizona in 1960, and he passed away in 1964. Um, and his remains were sent back up here, and he is buried at Mount Moriah. Um, <coughs> so sorry. So when we received this hat here, um, first we marveled at the hat, and then we marveled at the case, because if you look, if you guys want to come check this out afterwards, it has his monogram here, HCH. And then if you flip it, uh, and try it on. It probably won't fit my head. It's huge. My head is huge, not this. Uh, <laughs> it says HCH once again in it. Um, but then it also has the Hennessy's mark in there. So um, I found this photograph in our archives, the World Museum of Mining's photo archives, I should say. <laughs> and this is the Hennessy building, and right next door, across the street, would be that beautiful beaver block. Um, but this was probably taken around the time that he bought it. And you can read this note here. Mother says to tell you. So this was written to Stuart uh, from Isabella. So those are the children. And uh, their mother, Al Alberta, said, this is a silk beaver top hat, which your father wore to his wedding, uh, November 8th, 1911. And on state occasions thereafter, it cost $50 approximately. So that's a good amount of money yeah. in 1911. Uh, so quite, quite the beautiful hat there. So um, that was a really fun object that we were uh, gifted with last year. Where did you find that quote? Uh, it came with a hat. Sorry, I thought I said that. Sorry. <laughs> I mentally said that. I just didn't physically say it. Yeah. So they quote, they gave us that quote of, uh, it was a copy. It wasn't the original letter, but there was a copy of the letter wow. that came with it. So, yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So our uh, next object. Uh, was uh, belonged to a man named Albert <laughs> Beans Painish. Um, oh, and Jeanette's going to model it for us. She's going to be. Uh, she's going to be Vanna White. Uh, he was born in 1907. He went to work in the mines at the age of 15. And this is this is the coat that he would wear when he would walk from his home in McQueen uh, over to whatever mine he was working in. Uh, he worked in the East Calusa, the West Calusa, the Leonard. 
the steward, the tramway, and of course the one we're most excited about, the Orphan Girl Mine, which is where the World Museum of Mining is located. So we're pretty excited to have this piece of history come home. Going to there. I know, probably not at that point. You probably walk to the Leonard, the tramway, but probably not to the Orphan Girl, but this is what um, the donor told us, who was a family member of his. Uh, so he was a shaftsman and a station tender, ultimately, working in the mines here. Uh, after shift in the mines, he'd go back home, he'd have a little supper with the family, take a nap, and then he'd get up for his second job. And he was deputized by the sheriff, and him and his partner, Tony Bertolio, uh, would go roam the streets of Meaderville and just basically keep peace over there. So he, he worked a hard life, it sounded like, but it also sounded like he had a good life. Um, he enjoyed mushroom hunting. Fishing, hunting, ice fishing, and making Dago red wine. Of course, if you're a resident of the Queen Meterville area. Uh, <laughs> so, um, he died of leukemia in 1984, and his ashes are spread in his favorite mushroom hunting spot in the Highlands. So, yeah, so that's a great story. If you guys want to come check this out, it's really heavy. And the other thing they donated was this Palmy Parisian dye house hanger uh, on it. So, we've kept that with it. That's pretty cool. Um, but it has the leather, it's, oh, it's, it's a really neat um, article here. So definitely come check these out. So Lindsay? Yes. I checked $50 in 1911 is about $1,300 now. Oh my goodness. Wow. 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 This is a detective? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Nobody touch it. Don't even look at it. <laughs> well, that's how much it would cost. We don't know how much it's actually. It's, yeah. it's probably worth it. And the case. And the case. The case yeah. is yeah. 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 But that's how much it would cost to buy, to buy today. us. Wow. That's crazy. So here's uh, Albert Bean's painted right here. And that uh, photo was also gifted to us with his coat. So we love that when these items come in with the whole story. Right. So uh, our next item belonged to this guy. Who's familiar with him? Yeah, quite a few. Um, so we have his briefcase here. Uh, no money. Seven million dollars we can now buy our new facility. Uh, <laughs> um, and when this was first brought in, uh, Tony Denneke, one of our volunteers, brought it in on behalf of his brother Patty. And it was sitting just uh, in our workspace um, waiting to, <laughs> to be a session properly. And our volunteers would come in and they'd say, oh my god, you have Ed Renoir's briefcase. Um, so just the fact that people were excited about it got us even more excited about it. Um, me being just a smidge younger than you guys, you're a little bit more seasoned than I am, uh, <laughs> for the most part. Um, I, I've heard the name Ed Renoir, but I didn't quite understand the you know, great capacity uh, of what he had here in Butte. Um, so I started doing research on it. And an uh, interesting tidbit about this briefcase is Patty Denny, he bought a house on La Platte Street, um, and he found this in his basement. So isn't that a random little treasure? And thankfully, he recognized the significance of it and brought it up to us. So, um, yeah, isn't that weird? How did it end up in the basement? Very strange. Um, so Ed was born in Butte in 1898. His father was a mining pioneer here in Butte. He also went by the same name. His father was a foreman at the Badger Mine. Um, in 1914, at the ripe age of once again 16, you notice these guys all started pretty early uh, working in the mines, uh, Ed started working in the Badger. Uh, by 1923, he was married to Agnes Nevin at the St. Lawrence Church. Uh, 1924, he reached assistant foreman at the Mountain Con. 1929, he became the foreman. Uh, 1941, he was assistant general superintendent of mines for the Anaconda Company. Uh, 1951, the general superintendent. 1952, the manager of mines. And then by 1959, he reached the culmination of his career and he became vice president of the Anaconda Copper Mining Company. So, um, if you weren't familiar with Ed Renoir, that tells you why this briefcase is so significant uh, to our mining history here. Um, and then finally, in 1962, he retired after 52 years of working in the butte mining industry. Uh, he also, during this time, he graduated from the Montana School of Mines in 1920. Uh, while there, he played basketball in 1919-1920. And one of our events that we have every year at the museum is a scarecrow festival. So our theme this year is 1919. 
So we are going to do a <laughs> scarecrow of Ed Renoir, uh, being a basketball player for the Montana School of Mines. So yeah, you guys will have to come see him. Tell us what we did. Or do a scarecrow. Yeah, if you guys want to you know, say, I want to do Ed, that's fine, you can do him. Never mind. Um, but he earned his mining engineering degree, and then in 1953, he received the professional mining engineering degree in recognition of his achievements. Um, so, he, when he passed away, uh, he was a very well-known, well-liked figure in this community, and uh, a man named Edward Dennehy uh, voted, not voted, he lobbied to have the Alumni Coliseum renamed in, uh, in honor of Ed Renoir because Ed was uh, key in building that Coliseum. He was a big fundraiser for it, and uh, that didn't obviously happen, but pretty cool that somebody had that idea. Um, so him and his wife, Agnes, would have five children. Their children were Lorraine, Shirley, Joan, Donna, and Edward. Um, as I mentioned, he was very well liked in the community. During the strike of 1959, um, I read a newspaper quote, and this person was just named a laborer. They didn't actually give this person's name. But a laborer said after negotiations over the 1959 strike, where's Ed Renoir? I want to shake hands with him. So that spoke very highly, I think, of Ed Renoir's character during that time frame. Um, another quote from the Montana Standard was, he was a fine student of human nature. And he would write letters to his employees to bolster, bolster relations between uh, management and their employees. So that's also pretty cool that he took the time to do that. Uh, he was very civic minded. He was a member of a lot of organizations. So bear with me here. We got the Elks Lodge, the Knights of Columbus, the American Mining Congress, the World Museum of Mining, the National Boy Scout Board, the American Cancer Society. He then be, went on to become chairman of these other organizations, the Butte Country Club, the YMCA, the Butte Chamber of Commerce, the Montana Chamber of Commerce, and the Rotary Club of Butte. So <laughs> this guy didn't have a lot of spare time, um, <laughs> but hopefully he was happy to out there doing what he was doing. Um, and in 1971, a few months before he died, uh, the Rotary Club gave him their highest honor, and it was a Service Above Self Award. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Ed is pictured here and here. <laughs> um, and he died in 1971, as it's mentioned. Um, and he's buried out at Holy Cross. And then some of you may also be familiar with his home, which sat outside the Mount Con Park uh, for a while. Um, not Mount Con Park, now it's a park. Sorry, that's what's going through my head there. Um, so Mount Con Mine, which he was foreman out for a while, uh, and he lived on property there. So if anybody goes up to the Mount Con now, um, there's an area up there with a little gazebo structure, and it's called Foreman's Park, and that's because there used to be the Foreman's home that sat there. So. All right, so some of you are familiar with him. Say, can I ask you something? That makes yeah. Uh, the little hotel that's across from the Finland, uh, what, that's closed, the it's, what's it called? The Tate. The Tate. The Tate. Oh. It, it, I believe Ed's son has purchased that and is <coughs> seeking to renovate that. It's that, um, his nephew. Nephew. Okay. Nephew, yes. Okay. But he has, he has never anything. Where was that house located that Mr. Renoir lived in? Um, it was located right on the Mountain Con property. So if you go to the Mountain Con, do you know which mine is the Mountain Con? Yes, if you go up there and you go on the walking trail and there's that like picnic area, yes. it was right about there. And they have a nice little description about it too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. So, some of you knew who Ed Renoir was. How about this guy, Jim Matusi? Yes. Yes, <laughs> I love that. So, um, for those of you that knew Jim Natusi, knew he was quite the character, uh, quite a view of treasure here. For those of you that didn't, I'm gonna give you a little backstory on Jim. Uh, he was born on Christmas Eve, 1931, in Meterville, pictured here. Uh, in 1953, he married Jerry Demons in St. Helena's Church, which is now on the museum grounds. Um, Jim loved his Italian heritage, and I have the honor of knowing Jim um, through a view history class. And one time he came in and he told this story uh, about renewing his license plates, and he was all fired up about it. And does anybody remember what Jim had on his license plates? W O P walk. Oh, okay. So, as I said, he's quite proud of his Ital Italian heritage. <laughs> and, uh, walk is a derogatory term for an Italian, but if you're Italian, it's okay to say that to each other in this city, right? So he had walk on his license plate, and he went to go get his license plates renewed, and a lady there 
threw a fit, wasn't going to let him do it. He somehow sweet talked her and he was able to get it done. So he continued to have walk on his license plate for I don't know how long, um, but I thought that was pretty funny and a good little indicator of uh, his pride in his heritage there. So. Um, he loved cars and racing. He owned OK Tire and Anaconda at one point. He loved to garden, he loved to dance, and when he retired, he learned that he loved to cook. Uh, him and his wife, Jerry, uh, raised three daughters, Karen, Chris, and Kathy. Um, but the thing, when he passed away last year, his daughters last fall brought in a <laughs> Teppy, um, something that he was very proud of. Here we go. And that was his Meterville Volunteer Fire Department uh, coat and boots. And these boots are incredible. They're quite heavy, but put them on. yeah, put them on. They're almost oh, off to my, to my hip. They're crazy, but they have. Um, they're really interesting. They have like handles inside, so you can help pull them on. So, um, but those belong to Jim Matusi, a tribute character that just recently passed away here. Um, he was very proud of that. If you're not familiar with the Meadowville Volunteer Fire Department, it was organized in 1910, uh, disbanded in 1964 due to the expansion of the Berkeley Pit. Um, it's known for its floats and Meadowville Christmas displays, um, which some of you may have gone to the great presentation that was that just happened last December about those. Um, so uh, here's a photo. I was able to find one of Jim Matusi in our photo archives at the museum, and he is right here. So there he is. Uh, so I was pretty excited to find that too. And we actually have all of these guys uh, identified in this photo. A lot of our photos we don't. So if anybody, for example, knows these other four, please let us know. It's the only one we have identified is Ed Renoir. But um, this is one of the few that we actually have everybody identified in. And Jim Matusi, right there. So. Um, there you go. So, uh, last year we also received what we call the Smith Collection. It was 124 objects that came to us, and most of them were quite small. Um, about the size of a bar of soap. Wow. So, uh, they were pretty fun. This was a really fun collection to put in to our system here. Um, but it, we call it the Smith Collection because it was donated in memory of Owen and Alice Smith. Does anybody remember Alice? Yeah. Okay, so um, Owen and Alice Smith uh, were childhood sweethearts that lived a block away from each other on Granite Street. They married, had five kids, Kathy, Marilyn, Eva, Jim, and Walter, who goes by Wally, and Wally was the one that actually donated these items to us in memory of his parents. So Alice is actually right here. Um, we do have these other four people here. So we have, uh, I'm totally, Hal Hooper, <laughs> Camille, okay. yes, thank you, uh, Sarah McNeilis, and Jack Alt Altman, that's what it is, Jack Altman. So we have a photograph of Sarah, or Sarah, sorry, Sarah McNeilis, some of you know that I helped Cena Beth <laughs> write a book, not write a book, write an afterword about Sarah McNeilis, so that's on my mind. Um, <laughs> and then we also have this. Uh, photo, if you look right here, this kid in the foreground, who I actually didn't even see at first, uh, that is actually Owen Smith, oh, wow. identified as Owen Smith, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, gardens there. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, Owen Smith worked for Davidson Groceries at a liver man, and I asked Wally to share some stories of his parents with us. And one story, story he shared was he went to work with his dad all the time and helped him deliver uh, groceries. And one of the favorite places they would go was uh, the Peaky Noodle Parlor. And he remembers them sending down the hand basket and they'd put the goods in a little at a time and then they'd string it back up. So that's kind of a neat story here. Um, both of them were very active. Oh, yes. At that time, he lived on the corner of Second and uh, Right down the street from Yeah, excellent. Huh, that's good to know, interesting. Um, so, uh, Owen and Alice were very active with their kids in a couple organizations that he pointed out for sure were the Campfire Girls and Boy Scouts, um, and they were both active in the museum. Alice helped in the photo archive for many, many years. Uh, Owen helped with the buildings in Hill Roar and Gulch, and Wally actually did his senior Eagle Scout project, Lane Cobblestone. Oh, oh my God. 
Doesn't oh. that sound fun? So <laughs> thanks, oh thanks to uh, the Smith family, Wally in particular, we uh, have these fabulous stone streets here. So we got a couple more streets that aren't pictured on the other side if anybody else wants to take on that task. <laughs> no? no, okay. <laughs> Everybody's like, you're crazy. <laughs> so, um, so Wally brought these col this collection into us in memory of his parents, and I asked him, I said, where did all of this come from? Because as I mentioned, it's all tiny stuff that it, most people at this point in their life, they would have thrown away. Um, and he said, well, my mom always encouraged me to collect have a collection, she said, why not Butte memorabilia? So um, he started out with these BAMP stock certificates that he got out of a building that was being remodeled. His father was helping, so he went in and helped too, and he found these great BAMP uh, stock certificates, and they're tiny, tiny. So, um, so uh, one of the things we have actually quite a few items from is the Hotel Finland. Mm -hmm. um, which was originally the McDermott. So this was the McDermott, built in 1887. Um, it was purchased by Miles Finland in 1899, and the name was changed to the Finland. Uh, it was then tore down in 1923, and they started rebuilding in the image of the Hotel Astor that was in New York City. So this is the Hotel Astor, and then this would be the Finland. So it's kind of a neat comparison. Yeah. Not as grand, not as luxurious, obviously, from the outside, but still pretty darn good. Why um, did they tear the original one down? They just wanted to have a bigger, grander hotel, oh. it sounded like. Oh. So, and that's quite a bit taller. This, uh, this yeah. is nine stories tall, um, and it cost $750,000 to build in 1924. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Excuse me. So when it opened in February of 1924, there was a six-page spread in the Butte Minor, um, and Jan I can't remember the exact date. Anyway, February 1924, it was actually really interesting to go look at, um, if you guys are interested. Um, but it had all these things they were super excited about with the uh, Hotel Finland. One was they brought in a man named Maurice Weiss from the Placer Hotel in Helena to be the manager, the best of the best. Um, there's copper shingles up here, and of course, copper plumbing, and 5,000 pounds of copper were used at the Hotel Finland. Uh, all of it mined from Butte, smelted in Anaconda. So that's pretty neat. Um, Largy Lumber supplied the wood. The brick was from Builders Brick and Fuel Company here in Butte. Uh, what else? They had a contract with New Method Laundry to do all of their laundering services. So this isn't just, you know, bedding supplies. At this point in time, this is, you come to town and you need your shirt laundered and pressed and all of that. So they had a special contract. Um, they had the electric kitchen, all electric. Isn't that fabulous? <laughs> so interesting today to see these exciting things. Um, Eddie's Bakery, which some of you might be familiar with, it's now a warehouse. Um, they were contracted to make fresh bread for their guests uh, daily, and they actually put in new ovens uh, to make sure that they met the demand of the Hotel Finland. Um, inside of it, they had a barber shop, a beauty parlor, a brokerage office, a coffee shop, just to name a few things. Uh, so you can see that <laughs> there. They would also have uh, meetings and banquets and all sorts of good stuff here, um, along with I've seen photos, we don't have any in our photo archives at the museum, but uh, car shows, auto shows inside the hotel. Um, this one's for Packard Bell TV. Stops with more in 54, so that photo was taken in 1954. But look at those fancy new TV sets. Who's going to go buy one? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then another tidbit is their iconic sign. Nobody's quite sure when that popped up there. They think around 1939. Uh, it's 30 by 30 feet, and probably their best form of advertisement. And when it was, uh, uh, when that hotel went up in 24, it was touted as the finest hotel between St. Paul, Minnesota, and Spokane, Washington, wow. which I think would be probably correct for yeah. that time frame. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, World Museum of Mining, where history tells a story. So. Uh, Please come, come learn a little bit more of your history with us this summer um, and celebrate Preservation Week. Or, as Jeanette mentioned, if you want to come volunteer, be a docent, we would love to have you.